Everybody, welcome back. Playing the Binding of Isaac Repentance. We out here. What is this? Two wins in a row? We didn't lose that last one, did we? I don't think so. I, I have a very vague... Oh, no. My nemesis. Tainted... Regular is Hazel? That's regular is Hazel. Hold on. This might be a chance at, at redemption, actually. Uh, I... Oh, that's the wrong save file. Psych, that's the wrong number of the save file. Hush and Blue Baby. Okay, just think about this. Those are... Look, I'm not gonna say Azazel is a hard character. I think we maybe got a little bit... Um, we, we let our guard down when we won as the Lost, and then we just threw caution to the wind as Azazel, and we're punished for our hubris, as the case may be. So, here's one thing you need to know. Okay, I was gonna say I'm the best gamer of all time. <laughs> um, I was gonna go through the motions of pushing that... Uh, that bomb, one uh, little push at a time. Unfortunately, because Azazel can't really shoot uh, like a projectile, we had to use our body and, uh, you know, it kind of fell apart, but that's okay. No problem. Um, it is a Sunday. We're doing well. You know, family's still definitely feeling the effects of, I don't know, this, the 17th, you know, how there's a chili that has alarms. I never had an alarmed chili. I, I actually find myself kind of dubious about the existence of an alarmed chili. I don't know if, if, if it's a real thing. Um, what is an alarm chili? Well, it's like, I, I think that like a three alarm chili is like it's, it's three different ways of spicy. I don't know if that's necessarily 100% correct, but that's the way I've understood it at least. Um, you know, like in the Simpsons episode where I think Homer tries... Uh, Ned Flanders chili, and he's like, this is a three-alarm chili at best, maybe three and a half. And then Ned's like, I admit it, I'm a fraud. I, you know, the quote's probably not 100%. But the sentiment remains. We're on, like, I don't know, like, alarm three or four of this one specific illness, which makes up, uh, I don't know, 20% of the illness that I personally have been, con well, I was going to say been contracted with, but uh, that I contracted in, um... Well, like the last six weeks. <laughs> so I'm just like, honestly, I'm in good spirits. Um, I, I still feel pretty good. A little nasally. You know, that's that's how it gets on the tail end of, uh, of my own affliction most of the time. Is that like, when I sound uh, good, I'm in the rising action of getting worse. And when I sound like a total nerd... That's when I'm like 24 hours from, you know, completely feeling better. So that's good. But I've also, I don't know, I, I, you know, the human being in abstract is very good at adaptation, right? And I'm not talking about the Charlie Kaufman movie, although I wish I were talking about the Charlie Kaufman movie because, let, let me say, look, I, I have a lot of respect for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, have in many occasions in my life. Um considered it my favorite movie, certainly one of the best movies of the 2010s. Uh, I, I recognize that by saying that, I'm outing myself as not as art house as I pretend to be, because, uh, you know, there is some mass appeal inherent in that film. However, great movie. Great direction from Michelle Gondry. Makes you forget that Jim Carrey basically got paid, you know, like $200 million to just be a clown and contort his face in the 90s. It's a fantastic film. All that being said, adaptation might be better. I mean, it's it's hard to compare for a number of reasons. One is, um, adaptation is weird, certainly. And Eternal Sunshine has like a little sci-fi bend to it, but is mostly played straight. Adaptation, on the other hand, requires you to accept the absurd notion that Nicolas Cage is both himself and his twin brother. It's also, you know, Charlie Kaufman is both the scriptwriter and also the uh, main character. His brother also does not exist in real life. And then on top of all of this, it's an adaptation of a book uh, that is not actually about what the movie is about really at all. So it's, uh, it's certainly it's a one-of-a-kind movie. Hey, kids these days, maybe they'd be more interested to watch Adaptation 
knowing that it contains uh, a scene-stealing performance from Brian Cox, also known as... I don't know his name. Something Roy. <laughs> the, the patriarch of the Roy family on Succession. I've only seen, like, a few episodes over the years. Again, I hear it's very good. I hear it's very good. Don't get me wrong. But Adaptation, man, that's now that's a movie. Anybody out there saying Adaptation is not a movie, I want you on notice right now. Adaptation confirmed a movie. What have we been up to this week? Uh, or this weekend, I should say. It's normally where I go with the anecdotes. Uh, literally, like, nothing. I'm gonna go for Angel Deals, man. We, we can't afford these Devil Deals. That's how we went wrong last time. Uh... And when I say literally, as as everybody does, I don't actually mean literally, because, you know, we've done some stuff, but uh, with my wife being so sick, uh, and the baby really almost being over the sickness, but, you know, still sick enough that uh, I wouldn't want to take her outside, both for herself and for the people around her, um, just a lot of chilling out. I've been cooking a lot of soups. <laughs> I've been... Uh, Making the occasional grilled cheese. I've been watching a lot of Sesame Street, man. Hop like an astronaut. Hop, hop, glide like a shooter. Wait, slide. I almost got, I almost made it clear I was a fake fan. Slide like a shooting star. Ah, 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 ah. So that's been cool. Um, I gotta say, like, I don't, I don't mean to make every episode just, like, about Sesame Street, but what a show, man. It's, like, not even cl- it, I would genuinely, even though it's made for children, I, as an adult, even if I did not have a child, I would rather watch Sesame Street just for, like, my own enjoyment and interest over at least half of what's on television, but probably more. Because th there's all sorts of cool stuff in it. Like, one part, it, there's always, like, a- a how it's made sort of thing. Admittedly, if you're an adult, you know, sometimes it's gonna be like, hey, where should we put the plastic bottle? In the plastic container or the glass container? Like, you're gonna be like, I know this, but still, you learn a little something. Even if you're, uh, I, I promise you, even if you're an adult, you're gonna learn something about, uh, about the world around you from watching Sesame Street. And some of the songs go hard, man. You guys, and by asking this question, I'm mostly just talking to myself, but you see the season where, uh, what's her name, Haley Steinfeld? Hey, J Jerry Seinfeld? You see the season where Jerry Seinfeld is uh, singing a bunch of songs? I wonder, what if, let's try. <laughs> Sorry, that's a really, that's a decent joke if you've taken the sesame pill. Otherwise, you probably have no concept of what I'm talking about, which is very fair. Um, just acknowledge, I guess, that, like, you know, please allow me to speak my truth right now, as, uh, this is kind of, like, one of a very small partitions throughout the day, uh, where the baby is napping right now, and I have the opportunity to engage in, uh, that sort of silliness, you know? And it, it, to, to speak not in a voice where I'm like, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. But in all uh, seriousness, it's been nice having uh, a lot of quality time at home. Like, it, there's a serious, like, be careful what you wish for here. Because I was like, you know, for like months, I was like, man, we're doing like so much, so many activities and stuff like that. Like, it's uh, be nice to just have some downtime. Well, be careful what you wish for. Here's your downtime. <laughs> it's uh, kind of like a forced downtime. It wasn't really what I meant, but as someone who has seen... Bedazzled, starring Brendan Fraser. I should have known that uh, there, there is a little, there's always a little twist on the monkey's paw, right? You see Brendan Fraser, uh, he's having a moment right now because of uh, Saturday Night Live hosts introducing their guest gimmick Twitter account. Ladies and gentlemen, York. Anyway, that's my, that's my impression. Another, wait, wake up, honey. Uh... Okay, hold on. Hold on. I know you're like, why did I need to wake up? Well, just chill for a second. Till the next episode. Um, wake up, honey. New 10 out of 10 SNL hosts intro introducing their guests just dropped. It's Jeff Bridges from what I would assume is the late 2000s. Jeff Bridges, of course, 
uh, you know, in the late 2000s had a, not that he was ever not famous, but he had like another wave of fame after playing Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, mentor and nemesis, Obadiah Stane, in the first Iron Man, and then also portraying, um, I believe, alcoholic uh, country western singer Crazy Heart. Cra the movie was called Crazy Heart, I think. It was very, like, uh, people were talking about it at the time. It had some buzz. Anyway, get to the funny part. Well, he's introducing Eminem and Lil Wayne. And he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Eminem and Lil Wayne. <laughs> Eminem and Lil Wayne. <laughs> That's like, I can't, I can't even do what he does. But it took me like, like four or five watches in order to understand that he was introducing Eminem and Lil Wayne. I was watching and I was like, Eminem and Lil Wayne? Eminem and Lil Wayne? It's a good one. Now, does do any of these compete with what I would consider to be my top two favorites? One is Tobey Maguire in the in the audience going, "Ladies and gentlemen, Cisco!" And then the other one is um, Paul Giamatti, "Ladies and gentlemen, Ludacris," featuring Sum Forty One. It's just a very funny like Paul Giamatti. He's a funny guy, right? Like he's a serious actor. He's a very good actor. He crushed it in Sideways. It's actually it's such a melancholic, like soulful performance. Um, alternatively, like you know, depressed and angry. Like it's that's a it's a moving film. Uh, but is also a guy who gets dyed blue in the Frankie Muniz classic, uh, Big Fat Liar. <laughs> For some. For some reason, I guess the reason is probably money, and uh, and that's fine. But he he is not one of those actors who uh, only does serious projects, or at least historically has only done serious projects. But we've said it many times. I I would like to reiterate. I think that the average person has a false pretense of like uh, what they would do if they were an, a Hollywood actor. Like the, the classic Michael Caine quote, you knew it was coming. He was in Jaws 4, The Revenge, or whatever the heck it was called. The, and the reporter said, how could you be in this garbage movie? And he said, I haven't seen the movie, but I have seen the house that it bought me, and it's delightful. It's a great quote. And I, allow me to defend uh, Sir Michael, if you will. Um, or if I will, and I'm going to. I don't think that anybody on planet Earth should have gone to see Jaws 4 thinking that because it has Michael Caine in it, it must be good. So I don't feel like he took anybody's money except for the producers, really. You know, if... if uh, it's kind of a different story at this point. Like, if Daniel Day-Lewis is in a movie um, and it's garbage, I and it's transparently garbage, I would be like, okay, Daniel Day-Lewis, like, your whole reputation has been staked on being only in good movies. What gives? However, that's not Michael Caine. He was in Austin Powers and Goldmember as well. He's been in a lot of stuff that is, uh, dubious. I think, were I an actor, I would do, especially, and, and this is, I, like, well-trodden ground. I talk about it every time. If you're in a kid's movie, and people are giving you, like, uh, crap because the kid's movie is bad, like, honestly, get a life. I remember David Cross, you know, he's in Alvin and the Chipmunks. He's also, a, like, a very, you know, cynical, kind of edgy comedian. And he was on a late night show, and people were, uh, the, the host, I should say, not people, the host. Um, was like, how can you reconcile being in this movie that, like, is essentially just the transparent commercial cash grab with, uh, you know, your position as, like, uh, what a, a self-styled auteur of stand-up comedy. And he, he said something that, because at the time, it changed my mind. Because I was like, you know, it is a betrayal that he's in this garbage. Um, and then uh, he was just like, like, why do people care? It's a movie for, like, little kids. And I was like, you know what? What an astute observation. <laughs> I'm not saying you shouldn't have standards, but at the same time, you know, there, there's going to be kids' entertainment. You got to make movies for kids. 
he's not really in charge of making sure like the movie is good for Dalvin and the Chipmunks is good or bad just based like you know somebody wrote that script they got together like 60 million dollars or whatever it was going to take to do the CGI and then said let's add this guy to it one thing you see a lot honestly is uh like some of the thank you that's a very big item here some of the funniest people in the world at least to me oftentimes end up being cast in like a lot of absolute trash absolute trash like uh i without getting too i don't want to like ruin anybody's day or whatever <laughs> but you know i listen to this podcast is probably one of the more famous comedy podcasts in the world it's called comedy bang bang uh it's all improv they have just like i i find myself Mud it, getting that like Salieri vibe going again sometimes when I watch the show because I'm like these people are ten times funnier than I am with, with they don't even take like a breath when they get prompted for something like somebody will be mid-sentence and they'll interrupt and be like I know what you were gonna say here's what my character would do in this situation and also let's add like a well-crafted punchline to it like it's it's very well done it's very impressive and the people on that show um Oftentimes, despite being the funniest people in the world, oftentimes end up taking roles in pure detritus. And I think you just gotta accept that that's the way of the world. At least, you know, like Jason Manzukis, also known as uh, this Johnny character Wheaties, TikTok Mr. Wick. Um, I'm becoming inside joke podcast guy. Regardless, help me. Uh, what was I going to say? He's, he's in some movies. You know, he's in John Wick 2 or 3. I can't remember. Maybe both. Um, but he's also, like, he plays a pretty important role. He's probably, like, 6th or 7th build in uh, Dirty Grandpa. Not the good one, and I hate to say this, but the good one starring Johnny Knoxville. But the complete, like, the, the, the one that is so unfunny as to be offensive, not in terms of its content, but just in terms of the fact that so much talent was wasted. Like, in terms of pure talent wasted dirty grandpa is up there as one of the worst movies ever made one of the biggest offenders for sure and jason manzoukas is like he's sixth or seventh build or something like that i listen to him on the podcast he's hilarious at some point what are you supposed to do with the script i guess <laughs> you know you get offered a job you read the script what are you gonna do the you know, they're offering you good money, you're gonna turn it down because the movie Dirty Grandpa isn't funny enough? Like, it's not gonna harm your career. No, nobody's gonna see this stuff. Except me, on Netflix, 20 years later. Although, wasn't, it, like, this, it, it bums me out, but isn't Dirty Grandpa, like, one of the highest grossing R-rated movies at cinema of all time? Like, Soul of Apollyon. High, high, probably one of the highest grossing R-rated comedies, Soul if anything. Okay, Double Soul of Apollyon. Bercano Rune. Um, I think we'll take the Soul of Isaac, even over the, the Hierophant. I don't really want those bone hearts necessarily. I don't value them that highly, at least. Soul of Isaac could be pretty good here, though. Look at these flies, man. Oh, right, we get to take it with us anyway. Would you look at that? You know, why not? I guess. Temperance. Eat ten random pills. Mmm, that seems good. Anyway, this is an incredible run. I'm not trying to, you know, act like a... I was going to say act like an astronaut. Ah. I got to say... When I was a kid, did I want to be an astronaut? Is I think it's a very common dream. Yes, I did. Um, I really liked space as a kid. Loved that Magic School Bus episode where they went to space. I had some non... Like, this is genuinely true. I had non-fiction Isaac Asimov books. I actually did not know uh, until I was like, I don't know, maybe like 12 or 13, that Isaac Asimov was like, perhaps, and I still... St I don't think it's a perhaps. I think it's like genuine, but I, because this is where I know him from, it seems implausible to me. But I didn't know that Isaac Asimov, until I was like a teenager, was... Uh, more well known for being a science fiction author than for being like a hobbyist astronomer. Uh, I had all these these you know third grade aged books about like uh, you know how big the planets are and what they're like made of and stuff like that. I was really into it. Um, I got older and I kind of lost interest in space just because like it hadn't changed. 
you know? It's like, come on, get with the times. Like, the internet had come out. <laughs> Things had changed a lot. But space, was, Jupiter was still there. Like, yeah, I'm big. Yeah, hey, Jupiter, still got that big red spot? Yeah. Any plans on getting it checked out? No. Okay, well then, see you never, loser. <laughs> Goodbye, I'm piloting my spaceship elsewhere. To your cooler friend, Saturn, who has all those, whoa, look at those rings, man. But I gotta say, um, there were two jobs I wanted to do when I was younger. You know, like when, like very young, like three, four, five years old. One of them was astronaut. I would not have been a good astronaut. The other one, taxi driver. My grandfather, um, he, he held a lot of jobs, but one of them uh, at the time was taxi driver. And you know, when you're a kid, you kind of see what your what your family does, and you're like, yeah, without knowing anything about it, I want to do that. Like, if it's good enough for granddad, it's good enough for me. I think I would be a pretty good taxi driver. Couple of reasons. One is, I'm not saying it's an easy job at all. Um, I like to do, you know what, give me some damage. Um, I like repetitive tasks. I mean, dude, come on. Wait, do we want mom's knife as a Zazel? I never know. I also, look, I love that there's a forget me now, don't get me wrong, but we're supposed to fight, uh, we're supposed to fight the hush. I'm taking the easy way out, by the way. We'll, we'll just sink into a banter hole. If you hate mom's knife at this point, well, like, let me give you uh, the hot tip. Stop watching Isaac, you piece. <laughs> it's like if, you do, if you're a Golden War State Warriors fan, but you hate the three-point shot, well, life's going to be hard for you, you know? Start watching the 2004 Miami Heat instead. Anyway, who hates the three-point shot, too? You get to go, oh! I just wish they stuck to the fundamentals like a layup. Come on, you, that's what you sound like in my head. Anyway, um, I think I would be a pretty good taxi driver because I like repetitive tasks. I I don't mind driving. Like, I, I, can, I can find it meditative, or I can summon some anger from it, which honestly brings me great validation. Um, and then... The uh, the other thing is, as a, I mean, I'm sure the industry is not in a great spot right now because of you know disruption. But uh, I think I know what is bad about being a taxi. What what from the consumer side is bad about being a taxi driver? So I think that I could ignore those mistakes and my customers would like me. Like the number one thing, as a, well, there, there's a few. Okay, I'm not trying to hate on the taxi drivers. Okay. Genuinely, that's, I mean, one of the reasons that I preface this by saying that my grandfather was one doesn't make me immune to criticism, but it also, you know, it means that when I criticize something, it, 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 it's couched in the fact that I, you know, have respect for the profession to begin with. They're the people you can trust that get you to the airport on time, like 86% of the time when they choose to show up after you call them. So they provide a very necessary service of... Uh, really ratcheting up the tension of whether or not you're going to be able to make it to your flight on time and then usually making it to your flight on time. Only being a little bit freaked out because they said they'd be there in 10 minutes but actually took a half hour to show up at your place to begin with. Anyway, regardless, if, you, if you're listening to this while you're, a taxi, while you're driving taxi, I apologize. You know, we have a lot of jokes here. Sometimes they end up at the expense of the listeners. I make a lot of jokes at my own expense. I'm bald. I have a, an interesting gait. I walk on my toes idiopathically. It's very noticeable. It's one of the first things people remark upon most of the time when we built up enough of a rapport that they feel like they they have enough like social capital to to bring it up. Strangers do not bring it up. Well, like weirdos do sometimes. <laughs> They'll be like, "Hey, why are you bouncing like that?" And I'll be like, "You know, just I pretty much just completely ignore it." But it, it like, liter literally doesn't bother me. Like, at some point, you just gotta decide whether, like, that's gonna be your thing or whether you're gonna just get over it and acknowledge that it exists but not let it define you, I guess. It's not... In the whole scheme of, uh, you know, things that could define you, it's not that bad. I guess we'll go to Shoal. We got money. And it, that's the direction we have to go to begin with, so that makes a good... Uh, it's a good fit, synergistically. Um, so, yeah, I make fun of myself as well, of course. Um... But I feel like what, what's annoying about being a customer of a taxi driver? Okay. There's some things that are outside of your control as a driver. Not knowing when the car is going to show up, that's up to the app, that's up to dispatch, you know. 
one of the many reasons that I think people have gravitated towards the ride sharing services over taxis is because instead of, you, you know, calling a taxi and then them being like, okay, thank you. You can actually just book a car on the app and you can watch it come to you so you get an idea of when it's going to be there. But the, the taxi driver doesn't... I guess we'll check it. The taxi driver doesn't have control over that. What, is the, what do drivers do that annoys me the most? Lie and say that the credit card machine doesn't work to try to get you to pay them in cash? That's probably the biggest one. <laughs> that one's really bad. Um, drive like a maniac, which I understand they might do because they want to maximize their tickets. But as the customer, I would like to not only arrive alive, but possibly with a certain sense of, like, comfort as well. Um, like, the scariest part of... They, they always say, like, you're more likely to die on the way to the airport than on the plane. Yeah, probably, because, like, most people are taking a taxi to the airport, and the taxi driver is doing, like, a hundred in a fifty, and, uh, you know, changing lanes every two seconds. I really honestly... And, and some people will disagree with this. I honestly don't care that over the last, like, uh, you know, 10 years, every taxi driver on Earth has just started talking on their phone the whole time uh, that they're driving. It's not like... I. Here's the thing, okay? It's it's a lot like my take on like listening to music at work. I got... Yeah, sock it to me. Uh, I, got, I got nothing wrong with it. You know, you're in this car for like 12 hours a day. You got to pass the time. The only thing that annoys me is when they make no delineation of whether they're talking to me or the person that they've been talking to on the phone for 20 minutes. So, I'll, you know, they'll be talking to someone on the phone, and then uh, they'll be like, Hey, do you want me to take uh, Camby or, like, Oak? And then I'm like, well, they usually don't even say, hey, you know, they, don't, they just go, Camby or Oak, and I go... I don't respond, and then they go, Sir, can be your oak. And I'm like, oh, you know, uh, I don't know, we're on oak right now, so let's keep that up. Just be careful where the DE Dutch is. You know, there's a bit of a chicane there. You gotta be cautious about it. Of course, you don't wanna. Oh, no, unless you're gonna take it at 90? Okay, sure, just take it at 90 in the bike lane, no big deal. But I, I'm, I'm content with that. It's mostly the card reader stuff, and then also the driver that wants to talk to you. I think if, if the, the, the way that etiquette should work in a car like that is that the it should be up to the passenger if they want to talk. I usually don't want to talk. There's been times. I mean, I've met some interesting people <laughs> getting, you know, Ubers and stuff like that. It, it, it's amazing how comfortable people will get with you. I remember, I think this is when I went to... Yeah, let's take this. Um, we lose an item in the process, but that's okay. I went to Miami for a media event once. I just remember the driver. You know, it's like a, I don't know, half an hour drive from the airport to the, uh, to the uh, hotel where the event was taking place at. By the end of the drive, he was just telling me about, about how, like, aliens lived on Earth and, like, lived amongst us unseen. And I was like, oh, how about that? You know, I'm not gonna, you know, this guy's got my safety... Uh, tied up in his hands right now. I'm not gonna throw a monkey wrench into this conspiracy theory. Also, for all I know, he might be right. I, I don't believe it, but <laughs> he might be. Um, also, I mean, I don't even want to tell you the kinds of taxi rides you get around the 2016 election. You could probably do the math for yourself, but, uh, you know, let me just put it this way. A lot of people, you know, that... They're not shy about sharing their opinion, even to a stranger. And also, like, inevitably, and I, I don't mean to make this like a, an American uh, criticism or anything, but inevitably, they'd be like, where are you from? And I'd be like, a different country. I'm from Canada. And then they'd be like, what do you think about, you know, highly specific uh, American political issue? And I would be like, yeah, I don't know about all that. I just want to get to the hotel. I'm very tired. And then they'd be like, take a side. <laughs> but anyway. So I think I'd be a good taxi driver. I'm, I would maybe put on some music. I Here's one thing. I think the passengers on Uber have too much power. I don't think that the Uber driver should be forced to give you the aux cord. 
I get that you're paying for the ride, but that person is in their car all day. Maybe they take great pleasure in providing you a service, but I think by them... Well, I don't know. This is like, maybe I'm... I, I forget the Uber CEO's name. It's Travis something. Either way. Um, this is... He's, he's going to silence me for this, but... Because it sounds a little too close to, like, organizing into a union. But I think that some Uber drivers offering the aux cable puts a lot of pressure on all Uber drivers to offer the aux cable because it raises, you know, the standards of care for a customer. I think is, you know, wh what standard of care can you reasonably expect from a rideshare? Uh, a clean car that is safe? A driver that, you know, follows the rules of the road? And then, you know, that's about it. Like, every time you go to the doctor's office, you don't get to go like, Hey, hey, yo, pass me the ox cord and put on whatever you want. And nobody gives the, nobody's ever going to go to the doctor's office and leave like a one-star Google review and be like, uh, they didn't let me put my own music on. At least I hope not. Like, what, a, what a waste, by the way, of, of our trinket. <laughs> I got no value out of it whatsoever, but... I don't think I don't think you should ever steal the ox cord. I mean, even if it's offered, I think you. Sh I think there's a, a level of courtesy that is like you know it doesn't make you a bad person or whatever, but there's a level of courtesy that's like nah, man, you should listen to whatever you want. Come on, they're in the car all day. You can listen to whatever you want on your phone, like whenever you want. Same thing with like the the water bottles in the Uber. Look, I'm not trying to say I've, I've never consumed a bottle of Kirkland Signature uh, water in the back of an Uber. But I've also taken some Uber rides where I've been somewhat dehydrated. And it felt like this was better than the alternative outcome that could happen if I did not consume the water. Um, you got something for me? You don't have something for me. Excuse me, where's, where's my item room? You know, I've decided I don't care. I missed the part where that's my problem. You shouldn't, we shouldn't be getting Uber drivers out here offering water and stuff like that. It just puts, again, like, I, my personal two cents is it puts undue pressure on the, the other Uber drivers to do the same thing. Otherwise, you get this five-star inflation. I'm a big believer in the gig economy. If the service was provided as advertised, that's five stars. The, the people out there who are like, no, that's three stars, and then I give extra stars for, like, you know, going above and beyond... Bro, they like they just drove your food from the restaurant to you because you're too lazy to do it right now. What do you want them to do? Like include like a fun-sized chocolate bar or something like that? Like, I don't I just don't get the Like you think you're like the king of uh of DoorDash right now? You think you're like the lord of Uber Eats? Just relax. They they brought you your food. It's five minutes later than you thought it would arrive because there was traffic. That's the whole reason you didn't want to go to begin with. Just give them five stars and, like, move on with your life. I've given less than five stars only a couple times. One is I had someone lie to me. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. I found out later. Um, but the guy said, uh, I know you tipped through the app, but we don't actually get that tip. So do you have any cash? And I said, oh, sorry, man. I didn't know. So I gave him a toonie that I had in my pocket. It's a $2 coin in Canada. And uh, come to find out, you look, it's a small price to pay to learn a lesson. And it seems like he needed it in the moment more than I did. But um, come to find out, that's not true at all. They do keep 100% of the tip. I mean, there, there was a time where, I don't know, it was like there was an internal tip standard at uber eats and if you tipped over the tip standard then like uber eats took a cut of the extra tip or something i don't know if that's still not uber eats sorry doordash i don't want to <laughs> look both of the companies they got their own shady practices but i i don't need to make up headcanon for one that they might not have necessarily been guilty of just because they're guilty of other things let's just stick to the the case law here there was another time i didn't give low uh scores for this okay I, I think I maybe just neglected to rate them. Um, but my wife had ordered sushi from a sushi restaurant, and when the guy came, to the, I feel bad for this, but it's like legitimately is like 0% my, 
anyone's fault but the universe's, really. He came to the door and was like, oh yeah, sorry, man, but like, I was delivering it on my bike, and uh, I spilled some of your soup, and like, he was just soaking wet, and like, you know, he looked like a little scraped up, like he'd fallen off his bike or something like that. And then we just kind of had like an awkward, not really like a standoff, but I was trying to, with my body language, say like, that sucks. As a human being, I have a lot of empathy for that. But also, like, it seems like because you're not handing me the food yet that you expect that that story leads to some other, I don't know, like another transaction or something. But I, and, and I tip, I am not one of those anti-tip guys, okay? But I was like, if you think I'm gonna give you, like, an under-the-table tip because you fell off your bike delivering my soup and spilled it, we're gonna have to have a discussion about that because, like, I understand that you just went through some hardship, don't get me wrong, but I already tipped on the app, and then I'm not gonna get all the food <laughs> and all my other food, you know, all my sushi tastes like miso soup now, which is, again, it's, oh, little, little emperor's food tastes like miso soup. My food tastes like other food. Wah, wah, wah. I'm just saying, like, you know. Hey, take it up with the car that cuts you off. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button. Helps out a great deal. Of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. For now, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. See ya! See ya. I gotta find my uh, cursor. See ya.